However, when you look at the state of the Muslims, you will see that if they are ignorant about Tawheed and Shirk, it is not surprising to find they are ignorant about the issue of Wala and Bara. It is not surprising to find that they are also ignorant about the issue of who are our true allies and who are our true enemies. And there is a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where he heard what he saw and listened to one companion praying. In the first raqa, this companion recited Surah Al-Ikhlas. And the Prophet wasallam said, this is one who knows his Lord. This is one who knows his Lord. <coughs> and in the second raqa, he recited Surah Al-Kafirun. And the Prophet wasallam said, this is one who knows his deen. This is one who knows his deen. This is one who knows his religion. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا أيها الكافرون لا أعبد ما تعبدون ولا أنتم آبدون ما أعبد ولا أنا عابد ما عبدتم ولا أنتم آبدون ما أعبد لكم دينكم واليدين this is one who understands his deen. Because the basis of Islam is that it is the only deen and the only religion, the only way of life that is acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the deen in the Islam. Verily, the deen, the way of life, the religion with Allah is Islam. It is the only way of life acceptable to Allah and whoever chooses another way of life, another religion, it will never be accepted from them and in the next life they will be from the losers, they will be from the eternal inhabitants of hellfire. So it is impossible for a Muslim to believe in the unity of religions. Indeed, whoever claims that the Jew and the Christian are our brethren in faith, has without doubt made a statement of clear kufr, of clear rejection of the most basic verses of the Qur'an. They have rejected the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have not understood this deen. Why and what is the wisdom therefore of Allah prohibiting us from taking the Jews and the Christians and the disbelievers and the mushrikun as our awliya? I was once asked this question by some children in Sri Lanka in a Muslim school and the Muslim school had some non-Muslim teachers and I had to answer this question in front of all of them it was quite delicate and then I thought of an answer I said even if the person who is not a Muslim loves you and you will certainly find that there are non-Muslims who will love you and they will love you for being Muslims and they will respect your character if it is good and your akhlaq and your adab if it is good and they will be friendly towards you and kind towards you Without doubt, you will find people like that. And even if they are like that to you, 
And even if they truly love you and respect you and admire you, if you take them as your awliya, your friend and protector, that means that when you have a problem in your life, and you go and you seek advice, because from your friend you seek advice, you sit to them and you talk to them about your problems, yes? How will they advise you? From what source of information and from what direction will they give you advice from? Will it be from the book of Allah? Will it be from what the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said? Will they advise you according to the ruling of the ulama? They do not know the book of Allah. And they do not know the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nor do they know the rulings of the ulama. So when they advise you, they will say, Oh, Ufra Winfrey had some psychologist who said this and that. And I saw on this TV show, or I read in this book, or I heard something here or there. Or they will advise you from their opinion or their life experience. So even if they love you and they intend good for you, they will still lead you astray. They will lead you astray. They will not guide you with the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will not guide you with the guidance of Islam. They will guide you with their misguidance and that is what they are upon. So if we as individuals take the unbelievers as our friends and companions and advisors, then Allah has said in the Quran that they will not fail to corrupt you. They will not fail to corrupt you. Again, we repeat it. They will not fail to corrupt you. That means your corruption will be inevitable. If we as nations turn to America and to Europe and to the West for advice and guidance, be it economic or political or military or any other type of guidance and advice, they will not fail to corrupt us. Because their view of the world is different from ours. For them this world is the be all and end all. For them this world is the purpose. This world is the, uh, their paradise. They have directed all of their efforts mentally, psychologically, even spiritually to trying to achieve the things of this world. That is why. Their system, their economic system, is based upon riba. Because to them, all they see is the gain that they can acquire in this world. This is their viewpoint. And why does the Quran, what does the Quran tell us about riba? Allah he tells us that they say, that riba is like trade, it's like tijara. Riba is like trade. This is what they say, only we are trading with money. And really if you think only from the worldly point of view, you will see, and that's what you will think. It is like trade. I have some money, I lend you some money, because you are borrowing my money, you should give me something back. It doesn't seem to be irrational or illogical, only I am trading with money. But what did Allah say? Allah He told us that but Allah has forbidden riba and He has allowed trade. He has forbidden it. It is evil because Allah has forbidden it. And whoever deals in it, he will not stand in front of Allah except as one whom shaitan has made majnoon mad by his touch. He will stand like a possessed person, a babbling fool. Indeed, the one who indulges in riba has declared war on Allah and his messenger. War! Has declared war. Get more and you now own 25% and I own 70%. 
So I pay rent on that 25%. This is the only way that I know that is halal to get uh, uh, in lending. It's the only way that I know. And so I, there are some, alhamdulillah, Muslim uh, banks that are doing this now. The only problem is you need a lot of deposit in the first place. Usually you need 40%. But you, th you see things are coming. They, they are realizing now that Muslims, they have money, they have wealth, they have income. And for the banks or the lenders, this is a way of them doing business. And it's halal. So you will find, be have sabr. And the way that is halal will come. But if all the Muslims, they say, okay, we can all take...